With that, I'd like to see if our next speaker is here with us. That would be Jana Hoffman. Jana, are you there? I see a thumbs up. So, ah, there we are. Hello, good morning, Jana. Hello. Hi. And where are you coming from us today? I'm coming from Berlin as well, Germany. So also pretty close uh, to the previous speaker. <laughs> Excellent. Then greetings to the Hauptstadt, to the capital. We look forward mm -hmm. to your talk. I'd like to briefly introduce yourself. Oh, excuse me, I'd like to introduce you. Um, so Jana is at the Museum of Natural History in Berlin. I did some research on it. I've also visited the museum. The museum houses more than 30 million zoological, paleontological, and mineralogical specimens. And among other things, it's famous for housing the largest mounted dinosaur in the world, which is interesting. I ask a lot of people about that in Germany. They don't know that fact. <laughs> they should. <laughs> they should. That's marketing. <laughs> um, so, Dr. Jana Hoffman is co-lead of the Science Program Collection, Future at the Museum of the Natural History Berlin. The Science Program stands for the efforts to transform the collection of the museum into an open knowledge infrastructure for nature. This is intended to create a new basis for novel, multi-perspective forms of research and knowledge transfer in an open and integrated research museum. Ms. Hoffman's research focuses on the question of how innovative forms of access and use of collections in research museums can be designed that simultaneously enable the active participation of society, business and politics, and promote innovation. In this context, she is concerned, among other things, with the question of how collections at research museums not only provide knowledge gains for the museum's research, but also inspire the other research disciplines as well as the cultural and creative industries. With her doctorate in biology, Jana has a strong connection to the museum's research topics. Today, her talk is titled, Leading Change in Organizations Towards an Open Knowledge Infrastructure for Nature. So Jana, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our digital stage. The word is yours. Thank you so much. Yeah, I see my presentation. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to share my insights and to uh, in more institutional transformation. So we hear a lot about what individual um, researchers can do in terms of open science uh, and following open science principles. Um, I would argue institutions do play also a major role and they also kind of uh, link it back to the scientific organizations that we all belong to, being it uh, universities or large sized bodies. And that only can change the scientific system, uh, which we all think is, is necessary. And I want to talk about leading change in organizations, putting a spotlight on the organizational and institutional level. Um, and in my respect, in my institution, the Museum von der in Berlin, being a Leibniz institution on uh, evolutionary and biology, uh, biodiversity research, um, we want to develop our mostly scientific collection to house an open knowledge infrastructure for nature. Um, Many, or maybe not so many, I hope many of you have um, visited the museum um, on like a, just a private basis or maybe as a scientist. Um, so our institution um, is already pretty much uh, at the forefront of many open science movements. Uh, we are an integrated open research museum of the Leibniz Association, and we're looking back on like 200 years of history, which is mostly uh, kind of mirrored through our building, like this picture here, um, or our scientific collections. and. We do attract, and that is an asset uh, that not many research institutions do have, um, more than 1.7 million, uh, 1 million visitors a year, being it digitally or physically. So we do have both, um, especially uh, boosted by the uh, pandemic that we faced. There are actually about 450 people working at the museum. So it is a pretty decent uh, research institution. Um, of various um, scientific disciplines. We've heard before uh, what uh, our collection is mostly um, dealing with, um, but we're doing uh, all kinds of research now, also in terms of social sciences, um, communication science. Uh, I will talk about that a little bit more later. We do perform basic and applied sciences, and we do move because we do think it's so necessary to have a more translational science institute, meaning that we think that it is really urgent to transfer the knowledge that we do have um, the practices that we do uh, perform uh, more into other um, uh, areas of our society to face um, the big crisis um, and 
the challenges um, in terms of climate change, biodiversity loss, those are very close to our topics. But of course, also the general kind of problems with the democratic and non-democratic movements in, in globally in our societies. So, as I mentioned before, we have a strong record in open science engagement. Uh, our director, Johannes Poge, has been kind of building and uh, supporting the building of the European Open Science Policy Platform. He's still the president of the European um, Citizen Science Association. And my dear colleague, Susanne Hecker, um, leading one of the other science programs in our institution, Society in Nature, uh, has an outstanding team in terms of um, science communication and citizen science policy development in general. So we do have a school of public engagement and open science that is more in terms of capacity building. And we do build new frameworks in terms of indicators um, how we can measure impact of our transfer activities. The Museum for Naturkund is also um, a member of the Latin Strategy Forum um, of Open Science, um, which is kind of uh, hosting this um, conference here as well. But having that said, um, I would like to focus today more on a, a different aspect of our institution, and that is the infrastructure development, um, our knowledge infrastructure, our collection. And um, it is really important um, to um, shine a spotlight also on the activities when it comes to more infrastructure development and how tedious and how difficult the work is, how hard to communicate it is, um, and why it needs resources, why it needs time. And um, I have put the slogan here, it starts with people. So for me, it's very, very important that we do start with the people and organizations and create a common framework and a basis to understand each other and also create a common mindset, um, especially when it comes to implementing open science principles. So that the idea and understanding of open science is there basically to into all aspects of the institution and so that all the actions that are performed are kind of feeding into this. You do need for this, you do need for this committed leaders, leaders that really support um, open science, that are openly speaking for it. Um, and you do need the common and shared mindset. Um, then you can actually move, I believe, a lot of things. So my story at the MFN, um, the short acronym for Museum for Naturkunde, starts already like in 2016 when a first attempt was made by Johannes Vogel to kind of pull resources together uh, digitally to really kind of build a skill set on how do we develop also our digital infrastructures. And so the first science program was called Digital Sci World and Information Science. And uh, in 2020, uh, we had a great chance uh, to boost all these activities because we got a great grant by the German government, 660 million euros for 10 years to remodel mostly our institution, but also to transform the scientific collection and rethink the way maybe we do knowledge transfer and to boost these activities. And so in 2020, a new science pro program was formed. There are three at the moment at the Museum for Naturkunde, and I'm a leading one in co-leadership with my colleague, Christiane Kweiser. And this science program then contained all of a sudden, not just the digital infrastructures, data management, uh, research data management, biodiversity, informatics, IT infrastructures, but also the collection management and humanities department providing a more reflective perspective. And you can imagine that was an interesting start. It was a little bit like we all talked in different languages. and so. This is a picture here of the team that we put together, uh, more than 100 people working in my science program now. And they're ranging from basically students to scientists, to technicians, coordinators, and the junior professor that we do have. So we started in Corona in 2020 to think about how can we build this in a more participatory, in the mindset of open science, also in terms of organizational development in a participatory way, work together towards a common vision and mission for our science program. And we had to start digitally because of Corona, and that was quite a challenge. So, but many people contributed to this in, in the science program, and we came up with this kind of uh, vision and mission statement. Like, our vision is an open knowledge infrastructure for nature that promotes multi perspective thinking and action, as mentioned before. And we develop and explore our knowledge, data, and objects and open them up to all and to responsible research and innovation. And that's quite a claim. And well, we are not there yet, of course, but it was important to define and write down the goal that we all have in the organization of our science program. 
So in order to make this a little bit more digestible, we created a model for ourselves. Uh, and the model was from object to knowledge, from knowledge to interaction, and from interaction to impact. And we gave us guiding questions about how do we think the future of a collection in an integrated research museum, and how do we create these kind of spaces for these kinds of exchanges. And uh, we do this because we are a Leibniz Institute um, under the kind of um, um, umbrella of uh, research, uh, also applied research. So we have to define clear research questions in innovation areas for this, for example, heritage signs or evolution of uh, research data and things like that. Um, and so that is one part of it. We do the research in, in the belief of Theoria Compraxi of the Leibniz Association, kind of building and experimenting on ourselves, so to speak, um, reflecting on ourselves and, and transferring this knowledge back to other institutions. And uh, what I mentioned before, the infrastructure plan came through the project collection discovery and development in the Zukunftsplan of the museum, which gave us um, a large amount of resources to boost the transformation of our um, scientific collection infrastructure. So in this project, uh, which is, as I said, the infrastructure development plan, we really kind of try to uh, push our limits too in, in setting the goals that we want to become an open and digital uh, open an open digital and physically internationally connected research and information infrastructure and a platform for access and service um, that is relevant, especially for knowledge-based dialogue and, and innovation. We will build a new building in um, in Adlashof, a different part of Berlin uh, city, and there there will be the collection the center for collection future, uh, which will house an innovation collection management center and perform high, um, cutting edge research in, in the area of um, biodiversity and evolutionary research. And we will do capacity building and uh, build user oriented services there. So that's quite a challenge. I just want, want to give you this in advance in order to understand with the, with the kind of examples that I'm now kind of going through uh, that all the actions are kind of linked to this kind of common goals, right? that this kind of common and shared mindset uh, in the science program and beyond, of course. So I um, used the UNESCO recommendation of open science to structure my, my talk because I promised in my abstract to give kind of a 360 degree view on the activities. And, and this is an inspiration talk. This is about, hey, we don't do the best thing. We, we don't, we're not always successful with the things that we do, uh, but we want to inspire others to do alike and talk about the changes, especially when they're reflecting back on their institutional development in general. So the first um, section is about open science infrastructures. Um, we do, um, as I mentioned before, in the large site project, collection discovery and development, we do span the whole transformation process from the physical kind of um, bettering, housing, rehousing of our physical collection into connecting it and, and digitally kind of catalog it, but also connecting it with other um, knowledge sources, network it, and making it as accessible to all. And this is the claim. We produce a lot of these graphics in order to talk about what we do to the public, but also to our peers in our institution in order to make it more transparent and clear what we do. And so, as mentioned before, the challenge with that, we have 30 million collection objects. And of course, we do have going digital collections that are not counted in there. And we want to provide that basis for answering the big questions and give impulses for the future. There are six uh, research clusters that have been also formed in a participatory way in the museum that are kind of really kind of targeting, highlighting um, the potential uh, of collection-based research at the MFM. In terms of open scientific knowledge, um, um, there um, is the area of scientific publishing. And then many, many organizations went through this um, that they kind of um, transformed their journals into open access journals. That's one of the things that we did back in 2014 already. But one of the game changer was to create a coordination office for scientific publishing in 2017, an in-house service unit that kind of consults everybody basically in the institution about open access and publishing in general. And uh, from this, we created open access guidelines, also something that other institutions have been doing, but we also published them and they're already in a second iteration. So we do consult internally with our colleagues uh, museum-wide about this open access guideline. It has a due date and it gets revised. Um, so that is the process how we think we should do that. 
And we also do work with um, law and legal advisors, uh, especially when it comes to our collection data. There's a lot of legal issues or questions, I would say, um, to be answered. And we want to make the data as open as possible. Um, our goal is, of course, the public domain dedication, but there needs, needs to be some work done. And Elisa Hermann yesterday uh, presented that during the practical solutions, how that can be done. And we created a copyright guideline for media and collection data in order to be safe and also be a kind of an example for other institutions how to make this happen. And this is just an overview slide in terms of open research data and open source software. Um, there are many steps that we took in order to create ourselves or be uh, more open in, in also that aspect. We created an MFN data repository with DOI references. We do publish, and that is something we definitely have to improve uh, our software codes uh, on GitHub, not yet to the extent that I would like to have it. Um, we do have a, a consortium um, building an open source software ecosystem called DINA. Um, Michael Glöckler yesterday also presented that during the practical solutions. And we are engaged in national and international activities um, connecting us and making uh, building a fair um, data space environment uh, knowledge hub um, that is um, BFBO on the German realm, the German Federation for Biological Data and DISCO, the distributed systems of scientific collection in Europe. And we also decided to publish our data on our own uh, MFN data portal. And it's not a repository, it's a data portal. And the new aspect of this is that we designed this portal to be mostly accessible for the public and not for the scientific community in, a, in the first place. So um, that is maybe a little bit odd, but we thought it is really important that we make clear that we do have these kind of assets here, that we do have this information, this knowledge, those 30 million objects, not yet there, but um, that we make it uh, a, create aware, awareness for it, but also following all the standards that we would impose on publishing the data in the best possible way. And mostly fostering reuse, that's what it's aiming for. And one thing that you usually do not see is something that we created also back in 2020. Um, we created a series, it's called Scientific Data and Information Seminar, and that's mostly targeting the capacity building in-house for open research data and open software code development. Um, and that is a very successful series. Uh, you can see here the proof for it's really running and uh, on a, I think, bi-weekly basis. We do have uh, usually 40 to 50 listeners in um, just in the institution to kind of create communication space, um, knowledge transfer, also into all the other science programs and other peers in our institution. It's not yet public because we do really talk about institutional developments, um, but uh, we're also thinking about making this um, um, accessible also for external uh, listeners. And um, because we do have this kind of very educational focus also with our exhibition, we thought, okay, the infrastructure part also has to be represented in a better way in that kind of aspect. And in terms of open educational resources, we did create a playlist in our YouTube channel for the um, MFN, which is called Collection Future here in German. And we did um, uh, create explanatory videos, um, what we do and how we do this. Very short snippets, 1.5 minutes or something, uh, just talking about how we transform our scientific uh, research infrastructure and um, explaining the processes to, like, let's say, like an age of 10 to 16 upwards. Um, and um, I think that was a very good exercise for ourselves also to learn how to talk about what we do and explain the processes. Oops. In terms of open dialogue with other knowledge systems, um, I mentioned before, we have uh, research clusters uh, formed around the large size project, collection disclosure, uh, discovery and development. And one of the research clusters actually really focusing um, uh, on the to Berlin, like on a local kind of connection um, and uh, connecting with the local communities on the topic of nature in Berlin and see how we can bring stakeholders from the center together with other local communities and also do very targeted um, sampling, for example, in the urban area. And um, when it comes to indigenous people, um, of course, our institution has a great responsibility because of our history as an institution. And um, so we do have, of course, collection objects that have questionable and difficult heritage also 
in terms of uh, power structures, uh, racism and colonialism. And this is um, a, a very different, difficult topic for us as an institution to tackle. And I would like to give you one example of our Blandowski image collection that we just published a couple of months ago. And this is really about uh, making, first of all, available that we do have these wonderful paintings from um, Australia, um, but that they do and were collected with indigenous knowledge, um, but also that we are actually aware of this and did not publish everything because it may hurt um, certain kind of feelings of indigenous people in terms of, of the depictions of, of what you can see on the uh, drawings. And so we have put that actually in the um, explanation for this collection so that everybody's aware of it. We also do have a content warning in place that actually informs the users about this kind of situation that we do know of our heritage, of our responsibility, and we want to be you know, open for a dialogue. If there's anything that somebody sees that they do not agree with, that they can come to us and talk about it with us. And uh, one of the larger uh, kind of attempts uh, to really kind of face also marginalized scholars was a declaration together against discrimination, discrimination, prejudice, and racism as something I can really um, kind of recommend to other institutions to change also the mindset by putting up something like that um, to really kind of speak up against these structures and say, we are aware of it. You've seen the picture. We are not very diverse in my team. So I really think there's something that we need to do about that too. And the Museums Lab, as an example, it's a, it's a large size, the governmentally funded um, project that's running now in the third year. We are hosting it mostly, and we have uh, fellows from African continent uh, experts that do uh, go on a joint learning um, expedition, so to speak. Um, uh, in Europe and now in, in African countries. And we do have fellows that actually kind of talk to us and, and reflect on our methods and practices so that we do have a, a, a good exchange. And so we also had this workshop last year where we actually asked these fellows, like 50 fellows, um, 55 participants last year to comment on our development in terms of digitization and digital transformation and share their thoughts with us so that we can incorporate them back in the way we kind of do the transformation process, what we have to think about and where we have to actually get better or get actually in touch with these experts that can inform us pretty well about uh, other ways how to, you know, create more fairness, more uh, openness and more access um, to marginal scholars. In terms of open engagement of societal actors, um, that is something that we did, the large size project, as I mentioned before, collection discovery was well informed because before that we, we got a little funding for a case study to um, perform inspiration workshops on collection development. And we asked different stakeholder groups. So if you would have to choose or to say what you would want us to do when we start to transform our collections, what would, um, what should we do? And so we had these different stakeholders from medicine, pharmacy, from the culture and creative industry, from um, the, the, you know, um, the, the educational sectors, also our scientists. And we kind of summarized all this um, and tried to, you know, use this as a strategic kind of uh, guideline, what to prioritize in our development. And most people said, OK, first and foremost, we need to know what's there. Then we need to know what experts we can talk to. And then actually a third was just um, interacting with the objects, um, creating co-working spaces, networking data, and so on and so forth. So that was a very good, very general guideline for us to kind of include the feedback from others on our organizational development. And one step further, further that we took was then to create also um, um, an exhibition that is no exhibition. Uh, it's called Digitize, which is basically a workspace for our mass digitization on hemidopters and um, insect collection, which is a conveyor belt. It's a, it's a prototype. It's open innovation in on site because you can actually see this is the first prototype that digitizes uh, insects up to eight centimeters. And it's um, it's really for like up to 3000 specimens a day for digitization of the object itself, but also on the labels. And um, the visitors can see this, they can interact with it. There's an installation, an exhibition around it. And sometimes the conveyor belt just stands still when something breaks or um, something needs to be repaired. So that is something that we want to really kind of foster to show there is a process going on. There are a lot of people involved in that. 
um, and it needs resources to actually make things open and accessible. So also to kind of have this thought. On the other hand, um, kind of um, talking to the to the press about it, and it, it created a great press echo um, to say, um, okay, topics like biodiversity loss, um, loss of insect diversity in Germany, um, or how do we create democratic access, like the democratization of an ant, I like this um, the most, um, was something that we could convey with this exhibition, which is loved by the press, but also by the politicians. And I think there's a I need to really convince them that um, the open science movement and open science principles are the way to go. In terms of scientific volunteering, um, we are very um, fortunate that we do have now a position that's dealing with strategic development of volunteering. I'm very, very proud of that because I really think that we need to think about more about what we call in Germany Ehrenamt, like the volunteering and how we structure this, how we get people in that become ambassadors of our own culture and institutional culture when they go back uh, to where they actually work. Um, and there are, you know, groups. And so that is something that we really will start to build up now, which just started a couple of months ago. And we do, as mentioned before, a lot of citizen science activities that I don't want to claim here for because my colleague, um, Susanna Hecker is mostly responsible for this, like different projects, citizen science projects, building a citizen science center of competence. Um, and the, the, a nice project here is, for example, the Changing Natures, the Anthropocene project, as we call it which is also published on the Bürgerschaft and Wissen, the citizen science platform in Germany that is also kind of, um, you know, co-created with the museum. And one thing that we did in order to uh, our change transformation of our scientific collection is creating the former transcription workshop where we do invite people in to really kind of help us actually to transcribe archival material. And on the other hand, providing capacity building how to read this, uh, these scripts, for example, uh, so this is a give and take and also kind of going into the voluntary scheme that I just mentioned before that we want to make this more professional. Um, I just wanted to show this um, is maybe a small initiative, but a very kind of uh, rewarding initiative for all sites um, in this aspect. And then there are, of course, other formats that we tried successfully in order to see what can happen uh, in terms of reuse of our materials. Uh, the hackathon New Ocean Sound dealt with underwater noise as a big topic, and um, we wanted to foster creative views of our scientific kind of sound snippets, and so we provided them for a sound hackathon, and they created media and music compositions on um, under the topic underwater noise, which was then also alongside with the original sound snippets uh, published in the on the MFN data portal, and reused now again for our activities in science communication on the topic, but also by others in podcasts and um, for um, events that has been reused. The Edit-a-thon, which is uh, one of the newer things that we tried, is really targeting the open, uh, the, the Wikidata realm. So how can we connect better our knowledge with the Wikidata um, database and, and making it also available then for others to be reused? And so we had editor tons um, on colonial um, collection agents, which is also very tricky, a very important question for us to see that we can document who was collecting actually and what is the story behind the person. And we did that um, um, publicly, but we also did that in one way with our colleagues in the collection management team um, that learned how to do this. And that was a great capacity building initiative, I would say. And in terms of crowdsourcing, we uh, performed one test. Uh, it was called Bees and Bites in order to invite the crowd to transcribe our labels on a more, you know, large scale mass kind of aspect on the platform Zooniverse um, in 2020, 2021, especially in the Corona time where people had maybe not so much to do or uh, those people that were kind of bored uh, at home. And so we targeted those uh, people and it, it concluded pretty successfully, but the tricky part, and that's what we still have to learn, is how can we reintegrate this knowledge, this information back into our uh, collection management system and our knowledge system so that we can actually can use this information in a good way. That has not been so successful in terms of how can we really in integrate this knowledge um, into our kind of um, basic knowledge base. So, and um, I would kind of conclude with this picture and invite you to um, check more visuals on 
how we transform the museum. And I think it's pretty fitting when we say we have the museum evolution going on, uh, which is, of course, boosted by the Zukunftsplan that the museum is awarded. But um, it's really important for me to say here with all the people that talk about the big data and how um, we have to create infrastructures, it's, it's really important to not forget that we uh, need to change the people's minds in many ways um, and to kind of engage them more in the tedious job of, of making data fair. We heard that the first day, how, how time consuming that can be, but it's, it's so rewarding and it can help so much. So the process, I think, needs to be more visible. Organizations are good to, very good in a good position to kind of broadcast processes and um, show them. And um, it's, um, really important to think about organizational culture and not, not just the individual scient scientists and scientists culture, but really kind of the organization ha can have a great impact on um, behavior of their staff members. And this all needs to be a joint learning um, um, experience. Uh, we need to reflect on our doings. We need to really think about that we practice what we preach. Also the science, open science practitioners, um, when we call ourselves that. And um, I do believe that research museums are a very good place to negotiate, to talk about that. Um, so we, I would really like to invite um, whoever is interested and see how we can partner up, especially in, in terms of dialogue and positioning the topic more also in, in the political kind of debate. And um, I think we do have to, and this is what I try to convey today, show that there are small and pragmatic solutions to um, engage other audiences, um, other groups, but also making our data more fair uh, and more open. And that we should never forget as scientists that we do um, have uh, to include the public uh, in our thought processes and make them aware um, what scientists are trying to do in the open science movement and what our ambitions are and why we think that way and to create basically um, a better basis uh, to talk um, and raise the next generation in terms of mindset that this is kind of already um, um, wired in before um, they even become scientists and see the, the value of it for our democratic kind of environment. Jana, sorry and to interrupt you. I would like to close. <laughs> very good, very good, good timing. Thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. We're running a little bit short on time, but we did get several questions already. So let's just jump right into the questions. And since we're running a little bit tight on time, I'd ask you to keep the answers a little bit short, but really fantastic, right. fantastic uh, uh, presentation. The first question, are your activities, for example, concerning the MFN data repository, somehow connected to the NFDI, the German National Research Data Infrastructure? Yeah, so we do. Are, we are a partner of several consortia in the NFTI and uh, bi for biodiversity, for earth, for culture and objects. So we are in many of these consortia. So yes, there are, and DFDO is one of the big players also in biodiversity. Um, that we are very one of the data centers, basically, mm. that of data archives that are serving for that infrastructure. Great, thank you. Then to our next question that came in, if we can blend that in. Hold on one moment here. Are we able to blend our second? I know we had several questions come in. Just wait one moment, please. Having a small technical glitch. Hopefully we'll get it. Here we go. About your internal support center for scientists, how many people, full-time equivalents, work there, and what is their professional background? Yeah, so um, you're talking about the coordination office that is actually one FTE, one full-time equivalent of an information scientist. Um, very good, <laughs> that was uh, concise. And we have time for a final question, if we can blend that in here. Will MFN infrastructure be available for academic researchers and citizen science? Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's what we're targeting, <laughs> of course. I mean, academic researchers are in-house academic researchers, but of course also outside. And we do, I didn't say that, also feed our data to all the national, international networks like GIBE, for example, or the Europeana or the German uh, Digital Library. So we are well connected. I just wanted to focus today on the in our organization, uh, what we do have and what we change. 
Great. Thank you very much. Jana, thank you for a fantastic keynote presentation. And on a side note, if you ever visit Berlin, I can only highly recommend visit the Museum of Natural History and among many, many interesting things, the largest mounted dinosaur in the world. It truly is spectacular. Jana Hoffman, thank you. And to the rest of our audience, we'll see you at 1 o'clock. That's 1,300 hours German time, Central European time. That's in about 55 minutes. Enjoy your lunch break, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.